Well, <clears throat> the, uh, the text this morning is relatively short, Genesis 32, verses 1 through 12, <clears throat> but the sermon is a little bit fuller because I am going to read this text and then I'm going to back up and I'm going to um, explain what leads us up to this point in Jacob's life, the things that have to do with the promises of God. And because the scope of it is, is so broad, I'm not going to have a, the opportunity to read all the texts upon which the things I'm going to be saying are based. So I'm going to trust that you, know, that you remember these things from your reading of the book of Genesis. I think they're all fairly uh, familiar. And another thing is that everything we've done in the service up to this point has been really an introduction to the sermon. So I'm not going to introduce or give a separate introduction. I'm simply going to uh, bring out the points and try to develop them uh, from that preliminary material that comes before this and then this particular text uh, in, in the last of the, uh, the three points. But let's begin by reading the, uh, the text in Genesis 32, uh, verses 1 through 12. Now, as Jacob went on his way, and by the way, he's returning from Paddan Aram, from Laban, uh, going back to uh, Palestine, to Canaan, which is what the Lord called him to do, back to the land of his fathers and to his relatives. Um, and he's already met with Laban. They've already made the covenant of Mizpah and so forth, so that's passed. But now he's looking forward to going back uh, and meeting up with Esau. So here we go. As, now as Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him. Jacob said when he saw them, this is God's camp. So he named that place Mahanaim. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He also commanded them, saying, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now, and I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my lord that I may find favor in your sight. The messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and furthermore he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. For he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company, or then the, then the company which is left will escape. Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your relatives and I will prosper you. I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. For with my staff only I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he will come and attack me and the mothers with the children. For you said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing. Again, let me remind you, I've already introduced what we're looking at, prayer, the importance of prayer. I've already told you what we're looking at this morning, and that is the importance of praying based upon the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, based upon the promises of the new covenant, the fact that we are in covenant with the Lord. We're not going to see everything from this text. We're going to look at two main other points outside of this text. And this will be in the third point. But basically, what I want us to see are three things. First of all, Jacob's desire for the promise. That is, he wanted it. He wanted it quite badly. And I think you remember that that is true of Jacob. We want to see, secondly, how the Lord blessed him based upon this promise during his time with Laban and how he also protected him from Esau before. And then thirdly, I want us to see <clears throat> how he prayed on the basis of this promise. So let's begin with the first point. Jacob wanted this promise. Remember that Jacob and Esau were twins. They were the sons of Isaac and Rebekah. Esau was the one who was born first, which means that he was the one who had the right of the firstborn son. And to have that right, particularly in this line, was something very special. That was the promise that the Lord would give to him a double portion of everything he might bless the other members of the family with. It was a blessing that his brothers, in this case, since there's only one, his brother would serve him and his posterity. 
And most importantly, the promise that Messiah would come through this line. This is the one through whom the Abrahamic covenant then would be fulfilled. Now, as he was born, you'll remember that Jacob was holding on to Esau's heel. He didn't want Esau to get out of the womb first. It's almost as if somehow he understood what was already going on, though I'm not sure that we should necessarily interpret it that way. But this is how Jacob got his name. Uh, the name Jacob essentially means heel catcher, which literally means the one who supplants, the one who steps into the shoes of another. The way that he was born shows us something, and his name shows us something of his character from the very beginning. There was something he wanted. He didn't want his brother to get the best of him. Now, as time went on, that character was expressed, that he expressed in his birth. He wanted the blessing that belonged to Esau because he saw its value. He knew its value. Now, I think we'd all admit it's good to want what is good, but we do need to be careful that we go about getting it in the right way, which is something that Jacob didn't do. And we need to remember this, that even if the Lord wants us to have it, which he did in Jacob's case, he wanted him to have that blessing, we still need to go after it in the right way. Now, when Esau was older, he showed us that this birthright really didn't mean much to him at all. As a matter of fact, um, he ended up selling it for something that uh, was really worthless one day when he was returning from the field. Likely it was after a long hunt. He was so hungry that he chose to sell the birthright. And again, remember what this birthright actually meant. Maybe this is just the foolishness of an immature man. Maybe this is just, again, the, the evil of an unconverted heart, which it was in this case. But think about what he was giving up. He was giving up the double portion. He was giving up being first over his brother and having you know, his descendants be stronger than his brother's descendants. He was giving up being the one who, who would be blessed with having the Messiah come through his, um, his lineage. He gave up possibly even that possibility of being saved by him because many of those who were in the lineage of Messiah were saved. I don't know that all of them were, but perhaps the majority of them were. And he gave all of it up for what? A bowl of soup. Now this shouldn't surprise us because every day there are many people who turn down blessings which are perhaps even greater than this. What he offers through the Lord Jesus Christ, in a, in a certain sense they are perhaps identical to these. Forgiveness, escape from eternal punishment, becoming a part of the family of God and the heirs of his eternal kingdom, they give it all up for things that are essentially worthless, things that are going to perish uh, eventually. A little bit of fun, a little bit of wealth, a little bit of pleasure, which they can only have for a very short time. You know, as I was thinking about this, I remembered Moses. Remember, Moses was somebody who had to make a similar choice to this. Uh, he was basically, uh, uh, well, blessed in a certain sense to have everything that Egypt had to offer. Remember, he was counted the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he had to choose between that, all the wealth the world had to have. I mean, it, uh, Egypt was the, the dominating kingdom in those days. It was rich, wealthy. He had all the pleasures that money could buy. And he had to choose between that or suffering with God's people in order that he might receive the reward God had to give. And what did Moses choose? Well, he chose the second. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 11, verses 24 through 26, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Now, this doesn't mean that, uh, that he was looking to Christ, although we do believe that's what he was doing. 
But considering the reproach of Christ, he was the Christ in this case. He was the mediator. He was the Messiah. He was the deliverer. He considered taking that position and the reproach that would come on him for doing it, all the abuse and the hatred. He thought that was better. That was greater riches than everything that Egypt had to offer, not because he enjoyed suffering, but because he was looking to the rewards. The reward is worth anything you have to give up in order to obtain. And if you were to ask Moses today, are you happy with the choice that you made so many years ago, that you chose the, the reproach of Messiah, you chose to suffer with God's people rather than to continue to indulge in the treasures of Egypt? What do you think Moses would tell you? See, Moses knows now by experience what he only knew by faith in those days that what God has to give is far better. Now, when it came time for Isaac to give the blessing to his son. Even though Esau had already sold it, he still wanted to give it to Esau. Now, Esau likely did not tell Isaac what he had done. I mean, if you were Esau, would you have done that? Jacob apparently didn't tell him either, maybe because his father wouldn't have believed him, but I do think Rebecca did. I do think that Isaac knew. Now, certainly Rebecca did. She knew the blessing of the firstborn belonged to Jacob. Remember while she was still expecting and the two uh, were struggling, the, the warfare had already begun between them. The two, the two children in the womb were, were at such odds that she went to the Lord to find out if she was even going to survive this pregnancy. We read in Genesis 25, verse 22, but the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is so, why then am I uh, not this way, but why am I? Why am I still here? Why am I existing? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and this is what the Lord said to her. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body. The one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Now, Rebecca knew this is what the Lord said. These two sons would become two nations, Two nations that would struggle with one another for dominance. But the older would serve the younger. That is, Jacob would be the one who would receive the blessing. And his brother's descendants would serve his. Now Paul tells us that this was not something that just happened. It didn't happen because of Rebekah's plot. It didn't happen because of Jacob's deception. It didn't happen because Esau wasn't smart enough to see it coming. This happened because this is what the Lord intended. This was his choice. This was his plan. Uh, Paul writes in Romans 9, verses 11 through 13, For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, <clears throat> The older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now, Rebecca knew this. The question is, did Isaac know this? Now, it seems that Isaac did know that this was the Lord's will because he, after, well, after he realized that he had blessed Jacob rather than Esau, remember, he was blind, he couldn't tell who it was, and Jacob deceived him and so forth. When he realized that he had given the blessing already to Jacob, and he no longer had it then to give to Esau. He says this, Yes, and he shall be blessed. He knew that God's will had actually been carried out even though he had wanted to thwart God's will by giving it to Esau. But now just backing up a little bit, this didn't stop him from at least trying to give the blessing to Esau because Esau was his favorite because Esau was a man of the field. He was a great hunter, and he made lots of good food with the animals that he caught. Now, let me just pause here for a moment and point out another lesson. It doesn't really matter what we want, you know? It doesn't really matter what we stand to gain. If the Lord tells us that he wants something, that is what we need to do. I mean, Isaac, I believe, knew that the blessing was to go to Jacob, but he, gave it, he wanted to give it to Esau instead. We need to do that, and we need to do it even if it's going to cost us something. In this case, what was going to cost 
Isaac. You know, it was going to cost him his favorite meal. It was going to cost him perhaps, you know, since Esau was his favorite, having to give it to his second favorite uh, son. You know, even though it might cost us something, we still need to do what the Lord calls us to do. Now, Rebecca knew the blessings was Jacob. It belonged to him, and so at her insistence, Jacob deceived his father, and he received this blessing. Now, we know that God intended this blessing for Jacob. We already saw that. That was something he told Rebecca when she was still expecting. We know, Paul, how he interpreted that. That was a part of God's plan. But there's a real sense in which God did not want Jacob to get that blessing in this way. What we're talking about, of course, is the difference between God's decree and God's precepts. He decrees whatever comes to pass. He's sovereign. But he commands us to do what is right at all times. And deceiving someone into giving you what belongs to someone else is wrong, even if what you're after is something that belongs to you in the first place. That, that blessing really belonged to Jacob and he was deceiving his father so he could get it. It was right that he get the blessing, but not in that way. But the Lord determined to use that sin, that deception, to bring about his purposes. So I'm saying that just to say, let's not excuse ourselves for doing the right thing in the wrong way. The ends do not justify the means. We need to use the right means. Jacob did not use the right means, even though he had the right end in mind. God uses even the sins of his people to bring about his purposes. I mean, think about what he would do later through the sin of Joseph's brothers who sold him as a slave into Egypt. He delivered them all from the famine and he protected and provided for them in Egypt until the land of Canaan was ready to be conquered. The Lord uses even the bad things his people do to further his work. Well, Jacob wanted this promise. This is the first point. He desired this promise and he got it. Now, the second point is this. Jacob was blessed by this promise. Now, when Esau discovered what his brother done, had done to him, not surprisingly, he was angry, angry enough to want to kill Jacob, even though he shouldn't have been angry because he was the one who sold the blessing to Jacob for a bowl of soup and he did it with an oath. Jacob had him swear that he would give him that particular promise or that particular blessing and he swore with an oath. Remember what Jesus, we saw him telling us last week, our yes is to mean yes. When we say we're going to do something, we need to do what we're, what we're saying that we're going to do. We need to mean what we say. We need to be men and women and children of integrity. Now, Esau had sold his birthright, but he still wanted this blessing. And now that it was out of his reach, he blamed Jacob. It wasn't Jacob's fault. It was his own fault. But he pinned the blame on Jacob. I mean, how often do we find ourselves tending to do the same thing? I mean... That person didn't do it. I, I think of a, of a common illustration for myself. It's not the dog's fault that it's barking. It's the owner's fault that they're barking. And we tend to, to shift the blame where it shouldn't be. In this case, he blamed Jacob, but it was his own fault. Now, to protect Jacob from Esau's retaliation, his parents sent him away to Paddan Aram to Rebekah's brother Laban. And remember there, Jacob worked seven years for Laban's daughter, Rachel, and when the seven years were up, Laban deceitfully replaced Rachel with Leah, and he ended up marrying Leah instead. And so then he had to work for another seven years to get Rachel. And then as we see him spend more time there, we see that Laban did the same thing over and over again to Jacob, trying to take advantage of him. He made ten agreements, all of which he broke. Every time he saw the animals bearing a certain kind, uh, spotted or mottled or whatever, he would say, I want those. And then when he took those, and the others would start bearing. So then he said, I want those. And so he kept going back and forth, always changing the agreement to his advantage when he should have stuck to the original agreement. Again, when we say yes, we need to stick to it. Otherwise, the Lord is going to hold us accountable. And that's exactly what the Lord did to Laban because he knew what Laban was doing to Jacob 
And so he blessed Jacob, making sure that whatever arrangement Laban made, Jacob was the one who would benefit from it. Now, there are going to be trials. We're going to have to face trials like this in life as well. There's going to be people trying to take advantage of us. There's going to be difficulties we have to face. But the Lord will bless them for our good because of what Jesus Christ has done. The Lord blessed Jacob. He blessed him so much that Laban and his sons became jealous. And so the Lord told him it was time to leave and return to his own land with the promise that he would be with him to protect him from Laban. Now Laban came after him, and Laban wanted to force him to return. But the Lord warned Laban not to threaten, uh, not to threaten him. So the two of them made a covenant, they made an agreement, they swore an oath. They set up a pillar and they said, I will not pass by this pillar to do you harm. And the other one likewise did exactly the same thing. This is the one covenant that Laban actually did keep because he was afraid of the Lord. And the Lord made sure that fear stayed with him. Now, why did the Lord do all of these things for Jacob um, when he was being oppressed by Laban? It's because he had the promises he was the one who had received the, 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 you know, the, the birthright, the promise of the firstborn, the promise of the double portion, the promise of, you know, again, the relationship of his descendants with Esau's, and also that he was the one through whom God was going to send his son to the world, so he was preserving Jacob. Uh, he did this for Jacob because by the grace of God, Jacob belonged to him. Jacob was a true believer. He was his child, and God was watching out for him. And he did this for Jacob because Jacob trusted the Lord to do what the Lord promised he would do. Now, remember what we saw also last week, I think it was, in 2 Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Now, what that means is that you love him. He is first in your life. But it also means that out of that love, you trust him. You actually believe he's going to do what he said he was going to do. He made a promise, and you believe that promise, and you pray, and you trust that he's going to come through. That's exactly what Jacob did when Laban was threatening him, when Esau is threatening him, and obviously that's what we need to do as well. Trust the Lord. Now, the third point comes from our text. Jacob prays on the basis of God's promise. Now Jacob had trusted the Lord and he escaped one enemy, but now he had to face another enemy, one that he believed had more perhaps intent to hurt him than uh, Laban did, and that was his brother Esau. The last time that Jacob saw Esau, Esau was planning to kill him. That, that's how Esau felt about him, because he robbed him of his blessing. And so Jacob needed to trust the Lord again. And that's what we see. Now the first thing we see in chapter 32 is the Lord graciously giving Jacob this, this sight of the angels. I mean the angels are around but we don't see them all the time and he didn't see them all the time. But here he did to, to remind him that God was watching over him to protect him. So as he continues towards home the angels of God met him. Now, he saw these angels once before. He saw them when he was on his way to Padam Aram. They were going up and down this ladder that stood on the earth and reached all the way to heaven. And the Lord was standing at the top. And there the Lord was showing him that as he was going to Laban's, that he was going to be with him, that he was going to watch over him, and he was going to bring him safely back to Canaan and the reason he was going to do this is because Jacob, even though he had stolen that birthright through deception, that was the Lord's will. He had it now, and he even told him that he had it now. As a matter of fact, we're going to see at the end of his prayer here that he bases his prayer on that promise which was actually repeated to him by the Lord at the top of the ladder when he saw this vision of the ladder when he was in Bethel. Bethel means house of God. That's what he called it because this must be the Lord's house. Now, as he's returning, the Lord reminds him again of exactly the same thing. I'm watching over you to protect you. Here are my angels. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. 
So he named that place Mahanaim, which means two camps. Here's my camp. And by the way, Jacob did not have a few people with him or a few animals. He had a huge host and a huge amount of livestock with him. But two camps, his and more importantly, the Lord who was camped beside him, who was going to watch over him. The author to the Hebrews reminds us that the angels are ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. They are there. They are here. They are with us. They are with us during our difficulties. An angel ministered to Jesus when he was preparing for his crucifixion. An angel was dispatched to release Peter when he was arrested for preaching the gospel. Another was sent to encourage Paul while he was on that ship going towards Rome in the middle of the storm that the Lord was going to spare him and everybody on board. The angels are ministering spirits. The Lord has created them to be our servants. Now, when Jacob saw them, he was encouraged. And we should be encouraged as well because remember, if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, they are also watching out for us. So I know it's kind of a standing joke that when you go over the speed limit, the angels fly out the window of your car. They don't, okay? They're still with you. They'll be with you. As a matter of fact, they probably come down from heaven when you go over the speed limit to make sure that you're safe and to try to slow you down a little bit, okay? Well, next, Jacob sent messengers ahead to sound out Esau. I wonder if he still thinks the same way he did when I left. And when they returned with the report that Esau was coming out to meet him with a group of 400 men, uh, Jacob realized that he wasn't coming out to throw a party for him. He was coming out because he was still angry and he wanted to destroy him. So Jacob took action. First of all, he divided his company into two groups, thinking that if one was attacked, the other could escape. And that's wise. But then he prayed. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, to whom he prayed in verse 9, Jacob said this, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord. He was praying to the one who had made covenant with him. He was praying to the one who was the God of Abraham and, and Isaac, the God of his fathers. But he was also praying to the one who was in covenant with him. The name Lord there is Yahweh. That's his covenant name. That's the name that means that the Lord will always be with us and he will never fail to show his loving kindness to him. We do need to remember that when we pray, that we are praying to one who has entered into covenant with us through the Lord Jesus Christ. We are, are praying not only to one who is our Lord. Let's not forget, he is our Lord. We need to obey him. But we are also praying to our Father, to one who actually cares about us, to one who, who cares about us enough that he gave us what was most precious to him, and that is his Son. And if he was willing to give us Jesus, how much more will he give us everything that we need? What could he withhold from us? Now notice, secondly, the reason that he gives the Lord as to why the Lord should hear him in verse 9. He says, you said to me, return to your country and to your relatives, and I will prosper you. Well, that's what I'm doing, Lord. And now Esau is coming to meet me with 400 men. Now I'm in trouble. Now remember, when we obey the Lord, we're inevitably going to have to face opposition. Satan is always going to come out and try to stop us and try to get us to turn back. But when that happens, we can ask the Lord for help, particularly when we're doing God's will. As a matter of fact, if we're not doing His will, what the Lord will do is He'll turn up the heat until we do turn into the path of His will. So when we're doing His will, we can ask for His help. As a matter of fact, He allows the opposition to come to remind us that we can't do this ourselves so that we will call on the Lord. I want you to notice thirdly, as Jacob calls upon the Lord, his humility. He says in verse 10, I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. For with my staff only I crossed this Jordan and now I have become two companies. Remember, he went there a single man. He came back with a rather large company wives, children, 
many servants and a great deal of livestock, but did he come back arrogant and prideful? Lord, you should do this for me because I'm your favorite, you know? No, you should do this because, because I'm such a great guy. No, he says, I am unworthy of all this loving kindness you've shown to me. This is one thing that's missing from a lot of prayers that we hear today, especially on television, you know. We don't hear this humility. Who are we to stand before the Lord and ask him for anything? We're unworthy. But through the Lord Jesus Christ, he will give us everything we need. Now, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, verses 5 through 7, that the Lord tells us he will not hear us unless we first humble ourselves before him. He says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Do you know that's exactly what Jacob was doing? Casting his cares on the Lord, but doing it from a position of humility. And he was doing this because he knew the Lord cared for him, even though he did not deserve this care. And none of us do. It's purely a gift of his grace. We don't deserve it. It's his mercy. Now notice, fourthly, that Jacob made a specific request. We see in verse 10, Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he will come and attack me and the mothers with the children. Our Lord wants us when we pray, not just to pray in generalities and ask for general things. He wants us to pray for specific mercies so that when he gives us those specific mercies, which he actually will give to us, we will know it's from him and we will give him the glory for it. And then finally notice, and this is really where the title of the sermon comes from, that he based everything that he prayed on the promise the blessing of the firstborn, the Abrahamic covenant. Notice how he closes his prayer in verse 12. For you said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. I already told you, this is the blessing of the firstborn. This is the birthright that Esau sold him for a bowl of soup. The covenant that the Lord had confirmed with him when he saw him at the top of the ladder with the angels of the Lord ascending and descending. That blessing was now his. It belonged to him. And on the basis of that promise, Jacob was pleading with the Lord that he might spare his family. Now, I just want to close this morning by pointing out that the same thing is true with us. Every blessing that the Lord has promised to us is guaranteed by the same covenant. The same covenant that Jacob possessed by promise from the Lord. Uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, For as many as are the promises of God, and they are many, in him, that is in Jesus, they are yes. Therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. And what that means is when God says yes to us, through the Lord Jesus Christ, because of what he has done, he means, yes, the only reason the Lord ever hears and gives us anything is because of what Jesus has done. And when we ask on the basis of that promise, God will give to us what he has promised. Now, you know, we talked about before, our yes needs to be yes. When Jesus came into the world, he made an agreement, and his yes was yes. He went through with everything the Lord called him to do, and when he did, he purchased the blessings for us, and now God gives to us promises. And he says, these promises are guaranteed to you through Jesus. In him, they are yes. When God says yes, he means yes. And he wants you to believe that. He wants me to believe that. He wants us to trust him, and he wants us to ask him based upon what Jesus Christ has done. They are guaranteed by him. So when we pray, we need to pray to the Father. We need to pray to our Father, the one we're in covenant with, for the ability to do what he has called us to do. We need to pray in humility. We need to be specific in our prayers. And we always need to remember that he will answer us only because of his promise in Jesus. It's only because of what Jesus Christ has done. It's not because you're good enough. It's not because I'm good enough. 
Don't do it, Lord, because of me. As a matter of fact, God won't do it because of me. But do it because of your son. That's what it means to offer it in the name of Jesus because he's the only one who can actually come into the presence of the Father and deserve to come into his presence. We need to ask on the basis of what he has done. And by the way, this table we're coming to this morning is the representation of what Jesus Christ has done in order to guarantee the promises to us. He had to lay down his life. He had to give himself. When he said to the Father, I am willing to come and offer myself up as a sacrifice in order that you may save these whom you've chosen, he said he would do it. His yes was yes, and we need to be thankful that his yes was yes. If he had not followed through on that, we would be lost. As a matter of fact, Jesus is a man, which is unthinkable, would be lost as well, but that can't be. He had to follow through, and he did. And because he did, everything is guaranteed to us through his work. So let's think about that as we prepare to come to the table. And let's think about how we also have dealt with our own fidelity to the covenant, even as we thought about last week. Has our yes been yes? Have we followed through on our vows? Are we trusting the Lord? Are we, are we praying in humility? Are we praying, trusting in his promises based upon what Jesus Christ has done? Let's look at where we have failed and let's ask the Lord for his mercy and forgiveness and let's renew our covenant with him as we would then prepare to come to the table and receive these emblems, these symbols of his broken body and his shed blood, which was for us. Uh, let's spend a few moments in, in prayer, shall we?